Hello, and welcome to Battletech In Depth. Yes, that's the title I'm going with. I like being succinct. I'm your presenter, Caboose. I received quite a bit of good feedback in my last video relative to the previous one, so I have another project I'm going to touch on. I wanted to tackle this one because I feel like, again, it doesn't get a lot of attention. So come with me as we dive in feet first to the world of armored combat exoskeletons known as battle armor. Now, here at the Horsemen, we really don't have any infantry or battle armor, mostly because we're small. I've gotten some salvage over the years, but salvaged armor tends to be incomplete, in need of repairs or scrap. Also, sometimes it's, for lack of a better word, juicy. This makes it famously hard to salvage any specific chassis. Also, Interstrike technology necessitates the wearer having their suit custom fitted to them with little room for changing dimensions which is an intensive and complicated process that affects how the suit functions and how well the wearer can wield it. But not all armored exoskeletons are for battlefield use. In fact, most types are grounded in logistical or search and rescue roles. Everything from underwater construction to cargo handling, there are powered and sealed exoskeletons for nearly every role. Though often overlooked and overshadowed by battle mechs, the importance of a well-rounded army has meant that infantry especially battle armor equipped, cannot be overstated. Before I get moving on this, I want to thank everyone that helped out in the previous video. The BPL has steered me true, and I don't feel the need to rely on them anymore to be engaging or entertaining. My technician Warp Angel has been instrumental in keeping us maintained and helping with the technical and sometimes political details of any given unit, and the pilots of the horsemen for keeping me grounded and encouraging me to forge ahead. A bit ago I said that each suit has to be custom fitted to the wearer, and that it's an enormous pain in the ass, and that's true. I also said it's nearly impossible to salvage a suit, which is also true. But if you're lucky enough, and something like, say, an unexploded warhead happens to take the head off a trooper, then you're left with a little bit of cleanup and the need to purchase a new helmet. I'm above the mech bay today in the administration suite of the fortress dropship known as the Rat's Ass. Think officer's mess, except with booze instead of food, and a nice wide table to work on. It's also much, much quieter. I place a lot of faith in my technicians, but dismantling a suit from the Draconis Combine is tricky, especially without any blueprints. This is why I only hire... Experts. Not again. Well, you might as well come along with me for this one, we might just learn something. was awesome! Okay, what'd you do now? Well, I was checking if the target radar was sensitive enough to track an insect and fire control if it would engage if I did. What? No. Why would you think that? Better yet, why would you try that? Well, there was a yellow jacket that wouldn't leave my snow cone alone, and I didn't really think the suit had any missiles. It's from the Dracona Combine, of course it's got missiles! But it was a really aggressive yellow jacket. Well, I took the missiles out and thought we were okay. I didn't know it had reloads. Every suit has reloads. I got the yellow jacket. I did good. I tested the suit. And besides, yellow jackets are assholes. Kind of like Capellans. And you always say that the only good Capellan is a dead Capellan. So we have a good yellow jacket. A dead yellow jacket. So we're good, right? You know what? No. Hands off. Catch that divot before the captain sees it. You get your armory privileges back after you think about what you've done. Aw, oh, come on. <sighs> and this is why we're in the admin suite. So we may or may not have obtained a Kage suit, which I've coveted for quite some time. They're rare, expensive, and some of them come with shoulder mount SRM launchers with one or two reloads. In this case, it had just one left. Well, now none. Good thing we're in zero G right now for patching the ceiling. Now you might be asking yourself, self, what is battle armor? Well, battle armor is a powered exoskeleton that is armored against more than just environmental concerns, like inclement weather or hostile environments. Powered exoskeleton doesn't just mean that it carries power either, it's also powered itself and capable of amplifying the wearer's strength by significant degrees. Some are jump capable either through powered jets with fuel or the newer mechanical jump boosters mimicking the jumping motion of a grasshopper. All these suits vary greatly from design to design and most but not all have weapons integral to them. The clans in the inner sphere have their own standard or basic military design and things kind of branched out from there. 
However, to understand the inception and evolution of these designs, we need to look closer at their beginnings. Armored exoskeletons have been something that armies have wanted since they realized such a thing was possible. Unfortunately, it isn't as straightforward as just slapping some armored plate on a skeletal frame and off you go. Battle armor systems are actually more complex than those found in your typical battle mech, mostly because they need to be smaller. Battle mechs have a resource that armor has precious little of. SPACE! In armor, everything has to be shrunk down to fit in a wearable suit. All the sensors in the armor itself, the my armor musculature, power systems, medical, life support, pilot protection, targeting and tracking, communications, and even jump systems. This is an engineering nightmare on the best of days, but throw in the durability requirement of active combat and you have a nightmare times four. In the earlier days of ground combat, exoskeletons were available, but they were usually passive, spring-loaded systems meant to reduce soldier fatigue. They only got slightly more complex as the years went by, but it was generally easier to armor the wearer than it was to bolt it onto the exoskeleton. This of course led to the frame getting damaged during combat, thus hampering the mobility of the wearer until it could be repaired or removed. Now after significant R&D, someone finally developed a more rugged and power dense battery, meaning that the system itself could be hardened, which also had a fringe benefit of contributing to the wearer's protection, even if it was just by overlap. This also meant it could start sensing and reacting to the movements of whoever was wearing it, adding to its usefulness and opening up other possibilities. First, powered and armored exoskeletons were actually used in industrial and rescue settings rather than combat. Slowly, they made their way through the ranks, and once the design had been proven, the military started issuing them to the first to the crew responsible for arming vehicles, which decreased the overall turnaround time. Now, though these were technically armored, it was more of a side effect of being structurally reinforced than meant for additional protection. That combined with operational limits kept soldiers from deploying with anything other than light or medium exoskeletons, just enough to relieve the burden of the equipment they needed to carry, but not enough to confer any additional protection other than what was incidental. It stayed this way for centuries, with engineers, technicians, and even soldiers tinkering with it here and there over the years. It wasn't until the height of the Star League, as with many things, that saw the breakthrough in armor composites, computing, and power delivery needed to be fully explore the potential of battle armor. Thus, we saw the Nighthawk Power Armor Light Suit. Now, taken by itself, the suit was not great in a battlefield role. In 2718, it entered service, primarily in reconnaissance. They had gone ahead and taken the stealth armor they had been working on for mechs, and realized that due to the smaller size and sensor cross-section of the suits, they didn't need the assistance of electronic warfare suits to further confuse sensors, though they did include them anyway because it made them virtually impossible to detect through electronic means. Also, because it was run on power cells instead of fusion engines, hiding the suit's thermal signature was greatly simplified. With surveillance equipment integral to the design, it was able to utilize standard infantry weapons and even able to power energy weapon off its built-in power cell. Terran Hegemony Intelligence used these suits to terrifying effect and deployed them on repeat missions, keeping close tabs on all the leaders and major operations in the Inner Sphere. After many repeated successful missions, they were assigned to the Special Armed Services in a more permanent capacity. Within about five years, however, this new stealth battle suit made itself known to all the great houses, and the leaders, of course, wanted this technology for themselves. Each intelligence branch for each house did their damnedest to get intel on these suits, their capabilities, and if nothing else, at least what they looked like. Every operative from every house in every periphery nation failed, and were all found decapitated with a Terran rat on their corpse. Even the Star League wasn't able to get intel on these suits successfully, thus allowing the hegemony to maintain their anonymity and a small technological edge. Also, like most things Star League related, it didn't last. Just before the Ameris coup, General Alexander Kerensky had been able to obtain some of these suits for the Star League Defense Force. During the coup, the SLDF managed to refit them with a permanent weapon mount in the form of a grenade launcher. After the coup, and subsequent collapse and departure of the SLDF, Kerensky managed to erase the knowledge of the suit from inner sphere existence, which, let's face it, since it was a, such a closely guarded secret, it wasn't hard because no one even knew what the damn things looked like. He took a handful of them with him, but they weren't very useful to his goals, so largely they were discarded or used for parts to repair other equipment. He kept a couple functional and made sure they stayed with the SLDF core forces. This will be important later. (sighs) 
So, the Star League fell apart just like the rest of us watching the shit show that was the Ameris coup knew it would. Most of you know the rest of the story, but the main points are that Alexander Kerensky took as many people, ships, mechs, food, and anything else he could lay his hands on with them and inadvertently paved the way for what we have come to know as the clans. One of the most noteworthy thing the clans wielded on the battlefield outside of their advanced mechs was their battle armor suits, later known as elementals. The concept was so far removed from battlefield doctrine and more or less lost to the annals of time that the first units to encounter them labeled them as aliens and started calling them toads. As an aside, I have no idea how they got the name Toads. Elemental seems far better, if not cooler. The wearers of these suits could run at a stately 11 kilometers an hour. Granted, not that fast compared to a distance runner on foot. Now, taken by themselves, the suit with capable operator is scary as fuck. Besides running at an, well, we'll say an economical speed, that was about the only shortcoming to be found. But let's back up a bit. How did they get from the Nighthawk, which was armored against small arms fire, to something that could tank a hit from an inner sphere large laser without a breach? Well, even if you didn't ask, I'm going to tell you anyway. History repeats itself in a lot of ways, and the same can be said for evolution. And there's a phenomenon called convergent evolution, which in a nutshell means that when you present the same scenario to a broad enough audience, some of them are going to roll doubles and come up on the same solution. So, before they were armored, genetically engineered, walking, shooting nightmares, the basic framework for the elemental was used as an undersea mining implement. This is also where we see the basis of the name. Clan Goliath Scorpion had a dire need for resources at the time, about mid-29th century, and the only place their planet seemed to have them was underwater. Deep, deep underwater. And they came up with a titanium-reinforced exoskeleton they dubbed the Water Elemental. Besides being able to not just tolerate but function well in the ungodly pressures of the deep ocean, they were able to sustain damage and remain functional and sealed. As you might guess, after some time of suddenly having an overwhelming amount of resources relative to what they were used to, other clans took notice. The first clan to notice was their neighbor clan Wolf. Now, since they were still in the formation phase and getting their collective feet under them, no clan was really keen to start the dumpster fire of the past back up by fighting one another for coveted technology. Clan Wolf bargained 20 years worth of resource rights in their own system to Goliath Scorpion in exchange for the blueprints of the exoskeleton. Of course, being the upfront honor roll, but under the surface shifty bastards that all clans tended to be, they almost immediately set to weaponizing it. Better armor, adding weapons, upgrading mobility, nothing was ruled out until it was tried. They standardized the design by 2867 and dubbed them Elementals, a nod to Goliath Scorpion. They had their first legitimate combat trial in 2868, in which 10 suits won against 5 light and medium mechs of Novacat clan. Not too long after, Hell's Horses, being the masters of genetic manipulation that they are, started giving Wolf the side eye and thinking of their new enhanced infantrymen. These soldiers stood anywhere from 2.5 to 3 meters in height and had an engineered disposition to being extremely muscular and fast. So Hell's Horses and Wolf hammered out a series of trials that both sides were satisfied with and both had the same gene codes and blueprints at the end of it. Then Jade Falcon forces raided the place and stole both, again shifty bastards, disseminating it amongst the rest of the clans. Held's horses still held the edge. Their soldiers had already been birthed and undergoing training and were combat ready in a couple short years. They also came up with a mechanization system for the troopers to hitch a ride on battle mechs and not just ride into combat, but also plug into that mech systems and keep their power cells charged as well as take advantage of advanced sensor data that their suits just didn't have room for. These suits contained a single SRM-2 launcher with one additional shot, an inner sphere grade small laser, and a submachine gun for those pesky unarmored infantry. They were also jump capable, able to leap forwards 90 meters at once. Once the SRM rounds were depleted, the backpack that housed them could be ejected, reducing the silhouette of the suit and making it harder to hit than it already was. When the invasion was put into high gear, these suits and their operators were able to trounce what was on paper a superior force and do it repeatedly. Zipping across the map to the inner sphere side of things, about half a millennia of pounding each other into scrap and stupidity, an enterprising and well-known mercenary outfit called Grey Death Legion happened across a Star League memory core, one that Comstar hadn't managed to find, destroy, or prevent discovery of. Besides advanced tech like endosteel and sternal structure, extended range weapons, and fusion engine manufacturing techniques, 
This core also housed the blueprints for the long forgotten Nighthawk power armor. Now if it was you or I, we might look at those designs and think, well gee, with the scarcity of fusion engines, mechs, and pilots to drive them, it would be probably be economical to look into making these suits. Well, the Grey Death Legion thought so, and almost no one else. Comstar had been working on their own suit for a long time, dubbed the Tornado. Frankly, it sucked. It had less than the paltry armor of the Nighthawk, wasn't as versatile, and was much easier to detect. Still, they tinkered away, unwilling to admit that they had an inferior design because Comstar, and wasting money was also an old industry or pastime. But once they pulled away the curtain in the face of the clan invasion, the Grey Death Legion saw something they could work with and developed their own series of armor in the form of the Scout, Standard, and Assault suits that were frankly amazing. They did this on the side and collaborated in part with the new Avalon Institute of Science and came up with the standardized Inner Sphere suit, meekly dubbed the IS Standard Armor, or to people that first wore them, Gorilla Suits. It's important to note that though the Inner Sphere wound up with a standard suit, the Grey Death Legion had a standard suit of their own, but everybody else wanted their own. The Federated Commonwealth came up with a stealth version called an Infiltrator, looking to regain the glory of the Nighthawk. It was definitely stealthy, but it had very little firepower that could threaten a mech or even clan battle armor. The Draconis Combine took a radically different approach and developed the Sloth. This was more like a small, four-legged vehicle than a suit, as it was piloted rather than worn. It had the weapons that the Infiltrator lacked, but it didn't have the speed, which made the name uncommonly on the nose. So after combat trials, and despite what was generally considered acceptable, or even decent performance in their intended roles, they moved on adopting the standard suit like everyone else, because in the end, standards went out over proprietary tech due to the simple fact that anyone can work on them, make parts for them, and obtain the knowledge to use them. Now these suits couldn't jump, they had less armor, and they had no missiles, but they were feet all on their own and were rapidly distributed amongst the Federated Commonwealth to bolster their forces, because guess what? It's a lot easier to make ten small things than one big one. Shortly after, in the face of an unceasing threat, the rest of the houses followed suit. See what it did there? Nearly all of them were able to equip and train an effective battle armor force inside of a couple years, and following the truce of Tukiad, they were able to add jump capability as well, though a little more limited in scope and with a caveat. If the suit had anything equipped that required the bolt-on backpack, like a single-shot SRM-2, the wearer was unable to deploy the jump jets until it was discarded. Now, the edge that the standard suit did have over the clan counterpart was flexibility. Their weapon loadouts were extremely flexible as they used a modular weapon mount instead of a fixed gun. They could equip lasers, which was typical, but maybe you were taking on a known threat like tanks. Well, swap out that laser for a recoilless rifle. Going to be fighting other infantry? Pick up the mech grade machine gun or a flamer. Maybe you were after a hardened target? Ditch the armor weapons entirely and bolt the on an SRM-2. Like the clan elementals, they could also ride mechs into battle, like a case of nuclear fleas and swarm whatever they came across. That brings up a trait common in most battle armor. They can commit to something called a swarm attack. For the unwary or just unlucky mech pilot that gets a little too close, the suited troopers can jump all over it like the aforementioned nuclear fleas and start shooting their weapons into vulnerable areas not targetable at a distance. Once they've carved out something they can grab onto, they can use the enhanced strength and start literally ripping plates of armor off the mech and shooting directly at its internals. A common target for this tactic is the cockpit, and more than one pilot has desperately flailed and smashed their mech into the ground like someone made a sport out of stop, drop, and roll. Sometimes this worked, smearing the troops against the ground, but more often all it did was irritate them, as they would simply jump off, wait a minute, jump back on, and get back to work. Seeing the playing field get leveled is something the clans have classically been bad at dealing with. They couldn't innovate the suit much further. It was about perfect as it could get. But Clan Diamond Shark had a metric fuckton of this weird goopy stuff that was like crude oil. They discovered when treating it a certain way, it would flow for a brief moment and then harden regardless of the environment it was in. This stuff was called Hargel, and they implemented it in their elementals first before bargaining it to the rest of the clans at somewhat of a premium because, well, they were the only ones that had it. Even in the vacuum of space, if an elemental suit develops an armor breach, this stuff flows into the hole and hardens, sealing it. Same for underwater or any other condition. This made their troopers that one step harder to kill and stopped them from being painted all over the insides of their suits in the event of explosive decompression or sudden implosion. Yes, the stuff is actually that good. One last thing that is a feature of all suits is a medical suite. 
Besides condition monitoring, it can take care of pain management, advanced life support, think assisted breathing, and seal what would otherwise be lethal wounds. Well, for a time at least. The Clan Hargel system serves as a dual role in this area because it could function as an advanced wound sealant and tourniquet all at once. Now after the Tukiad truce, the rough corners were polished off the standard IS suit and somewhat of an arms race began once they realized what they had. See, where the clans were content to invent something and look at it and go, well, that is fine. IS militaries were much more imaginative. Clans wanted a one-size-fits-all solution, the IS wanted a suit for every occasion. The Draconis Combine were the first to try upscaling it, resulting in the Kanazuki. This two-ton monster had a mech scale medium laser, two SRM-2 launchers with one additional reload, and two anti-personnel weapons. When unveiling it, they had a captured, uh, recovered clan madcat with ERPPCs on it, capable of stripping a ton of armor off of a mech in one shot. They shot this suit point blank and not only did the pilot survive, I say pilot because it's a little big to wear, they stepped forward and returned fire. Now, the Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery thought this wasn't good enough, so later they revisited the design, ditched the medium laser, and added two infantry-class PPCs, which combined are also able to take off a ton of armor and obliterate most lighter mechs. They also swapped the SRMs for two single-tube medium-range missiles with eight reloads each. All this comes with a couple drawbacks, mainly mobility. The suit can't jump, isn't especially fast, and can't perform swarm maneuvers. But, like the urban mech, it's great at rapid response guard and garrison duty. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum, the Combine's greatest minds also came up with the Kage, and also less armored and armed. The plan was to make up for that with increased mobility in the form of jump distance, and after splatting one too many test pilots on the ground, they had to invent a collapsible partial wing that would allow the suit to jump slash glide about 120 meters in one shot. They also equipped some newly minted stealth armor on it, making it incredibly hard to spot electronically. These were, at heart, scout suits, meant to quickly get in, recon, and get out. Sometimes they had a more direct role in the battlefield, in which case they would jump in carrying parts of a larger piece of equipment, slap it together, do their job, and leave. They could carry nearly anything distributed amongst a squad, but common was some sort of mech scale target acquisition gear, and less common a mech scale weapon of some kind. Later, someone got the idea of making a man-sized Gauss rifle, and with grabby hands, these troopers got them first. Able to take out elementals at range with precision shots, they were instrumental when Task Force Serpent took the fight to the clans. I mentioned the Grey Death Legion and their custom suits before, and as such, it's only fair to cover them now. They wound up with five different suit variations named appropriately after their roles. Heavy, Infiltrator, Scout, Strike, and Standard. The standard suit had a single mech scale weapon and a single anti-personnel weapon as well. However, rather than spend the R&D needed to make the jump jets work, they used proven technology to boost the ground speed up to a sustainable and frightening 32 kilometers an hour. As fast as a speeding urban mech. The scout suit pared all this down a bit and went with a little more tried and true. Shaving 250 kilograms off the overall weight meant sacrifices. I dropped the mech scale weapon, some armor, and the speed boosting tech in favor of jump capability and an insanely advanced sensor suite. How advanced? Well, the GDL basically invented the light active probe and the clans had to develop their own to match it. Now they looked at the Fedcom infiltrator and basically laughed. They took their standard suit, added jump jets, a discarding parafoil for airdrops, stealth tech, and a freaking Gauss rifle, making their infiltrator. The heavy went in the other direction and dialed things up to 11 with a top ground speed of 21 kph, a portable PPC, improved sensors, and not one but two single shot SRM-4 launchers. This is more firepower than a commando, and it's equally hard to hit. The strike suit came much later and was the harbinger of doom. It came with an SRM-3 launcher and two reloads, plus a light tag unit to rain down fire from afar. Whatever a squad of these suits couldn't directly destroy, they could do so with the help of heavy artillery. There are a ton of battle armor variants, more than I feel like tackling now. Remember the sloth? Someone dusted one of those off and came up with the Rottweiler. With a top speed of 54 kilometers an hour, a small laser, and a large-scale needler, think flechettes but about head size, this quad-leg suit could run rings around any other battle armor on the field. The infiltrator became the Mark II, copying the GDL and added armor and a Gauss rifle. The standard IS armor was refined into other suits like the Cavalier. 
The clans looked at this going on, then at each other and collectively said, holy shit, and for once collaborated on their own new designs. First off the press was the gnome. Weighing in at a ton and a half, it had a single ER small laser and a battle armor sized streak SRM2. Hell's horses came up with this monstrosity and despite being overshadowed by other heavy designs, they still use it quite heavily and to devastating effect. Cloud Cobra came up with the Sylph. They shaved some armor, added a wing and actual jet engines, and turned it into a goddamn VTOL suit, complete with bombs that can drop on the heads of mechs below it. Fire Mandro's con saw the gnome and thought it wasn't hardcore enough, so he ordered something even more nightmare-worthy drawn up. His twisted-ass technicians and scientists came up with a battle armor so unique they had to develop its own armor just to make the damn thing work. Thus, we have the Salamander. Equipped with two flamers, a single tube Inferno SOM launcher, think napalm except on a rocket, and decided to add extra claws onto it, but made them all electromagnet so it could literally crawl up a mech and roast the pilot. The special armor? Yeah. This thing's fireproof. No, seriously. There's more like the Undyne, which is basically a man-sized submarine with a 5 rack long-range torpedo launcher, but one I want to touch on before I start to wrap this up comes from the splinter cell of Comstar, the Word of Blake. If you're not familiar with the Word of Blake, well, where have you been? If Comstar was quasi-religious, these guys would be the suicide bombers. That's about as far as that metaphor will go, though, because they're smart and scary as fuck. While anyone in their organization will throw away their lives without a second thought, they usually engineered a better way to do things. This brings us to one of their own suits, the Purifier. The Purifier suit goes back to basics, so to speak, dusting off the Nighthawk and following it to its logical and improved conclusion, active camouflage. Besides stealth armor and a mech scale weapon like an ER small laser or a support PPC, the armor is covered with hundreds of tiny cameras and is, in essence, a giant flat screen TV. The cameras take hundreds of environmental samples around it every minute and change the images projected on the armor itself to match, making it hard to detect while moving and borderline impossible while still. Now, if the operator pushes their luck and decides they need to run somewhere, the system kind of breaks down and can't keep up making it lag behind, which leaves the suit standing out like a lawn flamingo at a funeral. Regardless, when used properly, a squad of these suits are capable of sneaking up and ambushing nearly any unit present on the battlefield. Not gonna lie, they look freaky too. I mean, look at that. That's some X-Files or Predator shit right there. It's about time to wrap all this up, not just because I'm almost out of beer. To summarize, however, battle armor is the logical conclusion to looking at an infantryman and asking, how can we do this again, but bigger? Like many other things, it continues to evolve almost of its own accord, and will likely do so for a long time. I want to again thank my mechanic Warp Angel for helping me keep this shit running, my XO Defalto for helping keep me running, my motley crew of mercenaries for being a force to be reckoned with, and holy shit I have a fanbase now. Thank you fanbase! I don't know where the fuck you came from, but I'm glad you did. I want to thank Tex and the Black Pants Legion for continuing to be awesome and an inspiration. And borrowing his words, I want to thank Sarna.net for being the best goddamn Battletech wiki there is. Now, speaking of units, I gotta help Warp patch the one that I recovered. After he fixes the new ceiling crater. With more than paint in the chandelier this time. Hey Caboose! I found the chandelier from that Capellan Palace that we looted. We don't need to use the leftover one from Halloween with the pumpkins anymore. Well, I mean, if it works. So, until next time, keep being great and thank you for your interest and support.